Hello, I'm V.V. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury's library talking with Eleanor Bravo, Southwest organizer of Food and Water Watch in New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. Food and Water Watch is a national NGO focusing on consumer rights and on government and corporate accountability. Um, we're here to really to talk about fracking. Uh, which has become now a worldwide issue. The English are protesting their government's plan to virtually frack the entire British Isles, it seems. Homeowners in Pennsylvania and New York, as well as the Galisteo Basin south of Santa Fe, have protested the use of fracking methods. Uh, Food and Water Watch's take on fracking is clear-headed and full of information, in my judgment. So it's uh, wonderful to have Eleanor Bravo with us here today, and I'm, we're just delighted and honored to have you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. It's my pleasure. So we've all heard this word, fracking. Uh, it's, in, it's in the news everywhere, but I'm quite sure most of us, myself included, aren't really clear as to what the difference, say, is between normal drilling and pumping for gas and oil, which we do with exuberance in New Mexico. What's the difference between that and fracking, and what actually is fracking? So let me just put it into a little perspective. <clears throat> we want fossil fuels, we want oil and gas. So first, we drill a hole in the ground, just straight down, and they're gushers. We get plenty of oil, plenty of gas. That starts to run out, we go deep water. And you know what happens with deep water? fraught with a lot of problems. So we're exhausting our fossil fuels. So we have this, this new technology, sort of new technology, called hydraulic fracturing. And that's where fracking comes from. So we come back on land, and uh, you again drill a hole. But this time, you can drill down one shaft and then drill horizontally in many different directions. And you can access hard rock, usually it's shale, and trapped in shale formations is natural gas, sometimes oil, but primarily natural gas. So fracking is the term for hydraulic fracturing. Now, the, this technology has been around for quite some time, and we've been doing it here in New Mexico actually since 1949. No kidding. Yeah. But in 2005, it became disastrously dangerous because the technology became so advanced they found out the engineers the scientists found out that if you if you put a solution filled with sometimes 500 to 600 different chemicals that that allowed this pressure into the ground, you could get the gas out a lot quicker, a lot cheaper. So they call it in some places slick water yeah. uh, fracking, and that and that enables the fluids to go deep into the the shale formations and just ram the release of natural gas. So that is the kind of the layman's term of fracking. Two thousand five, the the method of fracking became exempt from the Clean Water Act and the right. Safe Drinking Water Act, right. uh, thanks to Bush and Cheney. Right. Uh, it's just, uh, it's safe, it's okay, it'll be fine, let's just do it, let's get all the oil and gas out of the ground that we can get. So, we're not taking old wells then and re-drilling re them and fracking them, we're taking brand new ones. Uh, so. If that's the case, um, then one question, I guess maybe two questions. How much water is actually used? Do we know what the chemicals actually are? And uh, is that water ever recoverable? So these are not the old wells. The okay. Frack wells are brand new wells okay. because it's a different physicality. <clears throat> right. And because the shale is in different locations. Of course. So uh, we use, they use brand new wells, so it's a, it's a new hole, it's a huge drilling pad. And we don't really know how much water, it is in the millions, some people say eight 
million. Some people say 15 million. Gallons? Yes. Gallons. Fresh water. It has to be fresh water because to make this soup where these chemicals are introduced, it has to be fresh water. So it's not like you can go find some water that's laying around and use that. Now, here's the danger of it. We don't know what happens to that water. These frack wells are deep, and the oil and gas industry wants to say that it's way deeper than the water table, and that there's no danger of it seeping into, into drinking water. Now, in New Mexico, we get 85% of our drinking water from groundwater. So we have a real reason to be concerned. And the conversation about fracking is a little bit different here in the Southwest than it is in Pennsylvania and New York. They have the Marcellus w watershed. We don't have much water. So uh, they can reclaim some of the water that they inject at high pressure. And then they have to re-inject that as wastewater it can never be returned to the water table. It is changed forever. It is uh, no longer can be used as water. It cannot be filtered in any municipal water system. So what's happening with this water, and usually it's, uh, I understand about 40% only can be brought back. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they put it in pools, but lately I understand that they are injecting it into waste wells and causing earthquakes. So the the process has so many other terrible environmental ramifications. So when fracking was exempted from uh, the Clean Air and Water Act, does that mean it was exempted from all governmental, all federal regulation uh, and all state regulation as well? The federal government would like us to think that the states are regulating fracking. However, in New Mexico, we have approximately 100,000 wells. And I, I understand between 50 and 90,000 of them are operating. We have 18 inspectors. Now, this is tough. <laughs> Plus, the oil and gas industry traditionally is a self-regulating industry. They don't have to report everything that happens. They are self-reporting. So we have had a number of spills. Uh, these frack wells leak. The casings crack. They're cased in concrete. Um, and in order to really be safe, these well casings have to last forever. Right. Now, unless you know something about concrete that I don't know, nothing lasts forever. I mean, look at the sidewalk. Yeah. So there's seepage. There is uh, a tremendous amount of water pollution that goes on. And, you know, we have communities and towns here in New Mexico that are running out of drinking water. Right. Should we be using fresh water to put down a frack well? And and I know this wasn't part of your question, but I no, really, no, no. really want to point out that... Um, Every bit of, of effort that is put into extracting fossil fuels, we are delaying our transition to renewables. Our objection and the environmental community's objection is that why are we continuing to cause global warming, trying to find better ways, sequestration, for fossil fuels when there are countries already, like Germany, that are 95% on renewables. Why shouldn't the United States be in that category? So out of those 100,000 wells, how many of them are actually fracking wells, one? And two, uh, do we really have any handle at all about the nature of those 500 chemicals plus or whatever it is that make up that soup that gets injected into the ground? So with such force? The majority of the wells now are all fracked. I would say, and uh, this is just an estimate from what I've heard and from what I understand from the industry, I would say 90% of the wells drilled now are fracked. And in regards to this fracking fluid, it is not, does the fluid makeup does not have to be disclosed. Right. And the industry claims it's proprietary. But Look, we went out and collected some of it. And it probably varies from location to location. 
uh, and you know we had some of it analyzed. So we know that there's benzene, toluene, diesel fuel, and they use sand in it as well. But these are endocrine disruptors. Yes, right. And in Pennsylvania and New York, there there are many cases of people getting incredibly sick. People having to move away from the homes that they thought they were where they were going to live the rest of their lives, and uh, their health is ruined. Right. The health ramifications are great, and and everyone says, oh, it's natural gas. It's cleaner. It's cleaner than coal. It's it, it's not true. When you frack for natural gas, a, a huge amount of methane is released in the process. Oh, really? And now we are able to measure that. We have some, some data on that. So if you take the process from beginning to end, it's pretty much as dirty as coal. So as I understand it now, um, they've been fracking here in New Mexico since 1949 usually with, uh, with, with sand and water and saline solutions. Uh, but since 19, I'm sorry, since 2005, uh, most of the wells, 90% of them, have been opened up with this new method. So uh, it's a stunning reality, isn't it, that you can have... Um, something which it really doesn't take too much common sense to see is uh, what I've come to kind of call no-brainer dangers. You know, if you've got, if you have clean water and you have to drill and drill down into it, way deep down into it, something's going to get into that clean water. We are not infallible. We are a fallible species. The things that we make, no matter how hard we try, are going to be compromise in some way or another. So I guess the question um, that is pressing on me is, um, is, is there any way, um, any realistic way to put the skids on this? Those are really excellent questions. And the answer is not simple. Yeah. In New Mexico, we get a great deal of our money for education from the oil and gas industry, right. as you well know. Right. Well, whether we continue fracking or not, it's going away. We feel that we need to find an alternative revenue stream for our education. There are many possibilities. We could, we could look at each of our communities and look at what may be a better way of earning a living here in New Mexico. Maybe it's hemp, maybe it's tourism, maybe it is something else in, an, in each community that we can devote some other effort. In other words, we take the pressure off the oil and gas industry dollar to fund our schools. Now, in New Mexico, the huge majority of the wells are in the Farmington area, which is the northwest, and the southeast. That's where most of the wells. Well, they're running out of natural gas there. So what's happening right now, and this is the battle that we're doing, is the oil and gas industry is looking at pristine communities, counties like Moore County and San Miguel County. There are activists there who have who live in these, this beautiful, beautiful countryside. There's never been drilling there because they, have, they haven't had oil, but they have shale. Yeah. And we want to keep the industry out of those pristine communities. And we want our government to find an alternative revenue stream for our education. And I want to, I want to, to impress that all of us we created this problem. We drive cars. Yeah. We use lights. Yeah. We created it. We can fix it. So these pristine communities, um, we know that, that also, um, not only uh, Mora and, and San Miguel and, and uh, Rio Riva County, we also know that there's um, probably one of the most beautiful and untouched places on earth called Otero Mesa, which which everybody has their eye on. And we also know, of course, that there's been a move to try and frack for natural gas uh, around Chaco Canyon. Um, 
Maybe we could talk a little bit about that and about the nature of the fracking site itself and what it looks like and what it sounds like and what it, what kind of disruption it would cause to a worldwide national, uh, to an international monument. Just recently, there were some regulations that loosened the the use of public lands for drilling and fracking. And of course, here in New Mexico, we have the very precious Chaco Canyon, Otero Meso, as you mentioned. Other states have their public lands. And this is an attempt by the oil and gas industry, again, to find more land that they can drill. And this caused a, a huge uproar in the environmental community. Our organization, as well as dozens of others, put out a, a huge cry saying, no, this is not all right. We were fortunate here that um, this region uh, had, uh, I heard, 38 permits that were expected in the Chaco area alone. Wow. And I have since heard that 34 of them now have been rescinded. So it seems like we've made a little bit of a dent but then what's going to happen in Otero Meso? We, we can't let up. So what does a frac site look like? It's huge. For one thing, it's not just this little hole. It transforms the landscape irrevocably. And because the water is not readily available at the site, it's trucked in and by the millions. And our little country roads have these trucks going in and out all night long. Now, I know that there have been some health impact statements, HIAs, uh, assessments done in some of these areas, and the amount of fumes, the amount of dust, the amount of noise pollution is really great. It, it, is, it changes a, a rural community into something that is unrecognizable. And Unfortunately, so much of the land that that they want to frack on is former farmland. Right. So we're losing our forests and our farmlands to our insatiable need for fossil fuels. So ever since the 1960s in the Club of Rome, uh, two words that, uh, that the oil and gas industry are loath to hear, we've known that, that there are non-renewable resources, and that indeed oil and gas are among that category. Uh, and we are indeed coming to the end of that supply. Maybe it's 10 years away, 20 years, I don't know. I don't know what it is. We know that there is a tremendous amount of un untapped oil and gas in shale. Um, and it's becoming clear to many people, as you say, that, that, this, um, that actually releasing that stuff uh, causes much more harm than good in the long run, in all, all kinds of ways, atmospherically and health-wise. So what are rational alternatives? You mentioned hemp, you mentioned, I mean, you know, it's, but, but what are the kinds of, what are the kinds of things that need to be incentivized now in order to get us over this hump and change our whole fuel environment? I think we're fortunate here in New Mexico because we have a lot of alternatives. We have a tremendous amount of sunshine and we have the technology. So we do need to communicate to our lawmakers. These things are going to have to be legislated that we would like to move towards getting greater and greater percentages of our energy from renewables. And it's not going to happen overnight, but right now it's a very small percentage, and our own utility companies aren't even reaching those small percentages. So we have here solar, we have wind, and we have geothermal. Right. So we have had sort of a, a luxurious time here because we have gas. Now, a com country like Germany, they have no drilling there. They are now 95% renewables. So I think that the initial move needs to be with our lawmakers. They need to come to terms with the damage that fossil fuels are doing through global warming and that these fossil fuels are pretty much gone. As you said, we don't know whether we have 10 or 20 years, but we can't afford to keep heating up the earth. Yeah. So 
I, I don't want people to think that renewables are just going to take the place of of our electricity. We are all going to have to make some adjustments. We we have to conserve water. We need to have more energy efficient ways of our uh, transportation. And in this country, we are used to a great deal of abundance. Yeah. And we do not have to give that up to be good stewards of the earth. But I think we need to all gain a an, an attitude of mindfulness over these precious resources. And I think with renewables, there will be enough for everyone. So if one had to... Um had to convince a legislator, let's say, of the um, of the inherent uh, dangers of fracking, uh, and one had to go up against the 34, I believe, oil and gas lobbyists uh, that prowl the halls of the state of the Roundhouse every year. What what are the arguments? The principal argument is jobs. Uh. The principal. So, the oil and gas industry has really inflated their jobs claim by about 900%. We have documented this. They say, oh, we're going to bring jobs to your community. It's not true. It's just not true. Because these technicians, or these engineers, they're not in Mora County and San Miguel County. They're not going to find local people to do these jobs. They bring them in from somewhere else. And then once they get the well drilled, it is sustained by a few and a, a lot fewer personnel. So it, it's not going to bring jobs and it's not going to sustain a community. It's a transient community. That is the principal argument. Wow. And we would like to see jobs that are long-term, not just the short-term. And we've recently done a, an incredible study on the social impacts of fracking. It, it creates a, a completely different kind of community, hmm. transient, and, uh, of course, the pollution, and it just changes the community irrevocably. So so this is, this is what I... I tell the lawmakers, and not only do we tell the lawmakers, we build coalitions with other organizations, and we get their constituents to reach out to them in so many ways, through email, through phone calls, through petitions, saying, look, this isn't going to work for us long term. We are not willing to give up our lifestyle in our rural community for this little bit of oil and gas. We want to go immediately to renewables, and we have the technology to do it. We need these lawmakers to have this vision. Look, there are things in this country, everyone says, oh, we can't do that. We used to have slavery in this country. You know what? We don't have it anymore. <laughs> This is a big issue, but it's not an impossible issue to deal with. And it is. it needs to be dealt with now because at the time when we wake up to it, it, may, it might be too late. We might see the destruction of a lot of our communities by that time. This is a critical timing that we need to address this now. We don't know how much time we have. As you said, is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? And this is what I say when I talk to to lawmakers, I, I say to them, have some vision for Mora County, for San Miguel County, for Guadalupe County. Have some vision for the people who live there and have some vision for our state in context for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. These fossil fuels will not last forever. Do something now. If you, um, if you're a county commissioner, let's say, and you suddenly um, have a change of heart and you say, okay, I'm going to vote for these things. Uh, and you're told that, don't worry, uh, these roads and this little pad are only going to take up one or two percent of your, of your land. It's not going to do any damage at all. We all know that you drive a truck over a piece of virgin country once and those tracks are there for decades. You drive over them 2,000 times like I've been reading about some of the... Uh, of the uh, statistics of traveling from site to site, uh, uh, they're there forever. I mean, there's no chance of reclamation here. So you have global warming, you have uh, irreconcilable damage, 
you have uh, an incredibly short-term solution to a long-range problem. Um, it seems like uh, it seems like the arguments are adding up and adding up. What? And I, I guess this is the final question, really. What are the counter arguments aside from jobs? I mean, if I mean, if they are inflating their job uh, numbers by 900 <clears> percent, <throat> that's a um, I shouldn't think one should be able to punch a hole in that pretty quickly. Uh, but there are other arguments, obviously, too. So I'd just like to ask you that so we can all have those in our heads when we're making our calls. You know, unfortunately, times are, are sort of tough right now. Yes. Uh, we're in drought. Farmers aren't getting crop yields. So the arguments have to... We have to be strong with our arguments. Right. We have to look to the future and we have to say that okay you say that there's there's going to be jobs you say we're all going to get money you say that we're all going to get oil and gas and energy for what we need forever and so we have we come back with a science we have to show from a scientific point of view that these things are not true we need to educate more deeply our lawmakers and our population that this short-term fix is no fix whatsoever. It's not an easy argument no. at all. And it is a kind of a sad story. And in New Mexico, I think the best argument is you're going to take our drinking water, which we have very little of, and ram it down a, a well to get oil and gas for some company that isn't even living in New Mexico. This money, these profits, these are called extractive industries. Our state government only gets a very small percentage of what this fuel is sold for. Now, this is wrong. The people of New Mexico aren't really benefiting in comparison to the amount of damage that this industry is doing to our state. Eleanor, thank you so very much. It was such a clear and insightful uh, presentation on this really complicated and sort of hair-raising issue. We're very grateful to have you here in the library of the New Mexico Mercury and hope to have you back in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure. I hope that this conversation will continue. <laughs>